Hey, what's going on? It's Scott. In this video, I'm interviewing Victor Avila. He's a retired federal agent who, unfortunately, him and his partner were ambushed when they were on assignment down in Mexico back in 2011. And Victor will talk about the aftermath of that incident as well. But then Victor has insider info regarding what is really going on at our southern border. And he's going to talk about that as well. It's not something you want to bury your head in the sand about. You need to hear about it. Here's my interview with Victor Avila. I want to go ahead and just dive right in and get right to February 15th of 2011. Uh, can you tell us what happened on that tragic day? Absolutely. February 15, 2011. Uh, uh, not a day goes by that I think about Special Agent Jaime Zapata. Him and I uh, were working in Mexico. I was there as a, uh, as a U.S. diplomat and ICE representative. Uh, Agent Zapata was there working uh, temporarily on a uh, a big, big uh, arms trafficking case. And we got put together to go make this run, if you will, to from Mexico towards uh, Monterey to go pick up some equipment that our bosses uh, apparently had a uh, an urgent need for, for a different case, a big money laundry case that was being worked by a lot of people. Uh, I worked a little bit on it, but not I wasn't the case agent on this case. Um, I challenged the assignment as soon as they came on February 14th on Valentine's Day, the day before, because uh, I hadn't been briefed on it. And in law enforcement, that's like the first thing that, that you have to do is you got to be present at the briefing in order to play. That's the way it kind of goes. And I wasn't. I was brought in uh, at the 11th hour and told you got to go pick up this equipment and get together with our ICE representatives out of the uh, uh, Monterey office. Well, wait a minute. First of all, we knew that uh, Highway 57, which is the main corridor, is the, the toll road, the safe road, if you will, um, uh, was being controlled uh, by a large portion of it was being controlled by Los Zetas cartel. And mm -hmm. I knew that. My bosses knew that. And as a matter of fact, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador knew that. And the regional security office, they had even put out an alert a couple of weeks before that saying that all U.S. personnel were prohibited from driving on that Highway 57 for personal or business reasons. And wow. if you had to drive on there, you needed uh, a, a written consent from the ambassador himself. And that was ignored. So I brought up all these issues. We got on the phone with uh, the the ICE reps of Monterey. We went over this. I, I said, well, why don't we just fly this equipment uh, or bring it in a diplomatic pouch uh, truck? And they said, oh, yeah, we already talked about this. We've already kind of uh, talked about these options and have been... Uh, uh, excluded and say, no, we want to go get it right now. And so it got to a point where I made my supervisor go even ask the deputy attache uh, who was behind closed doors with the attache, the ICE attache, uh, and to tell him these revelations that I had just found out about. And as far as, uh, you know, the assignment and uh, the deputy attache came out and said that he wasn't aware of any security issues in Mexico. Mm -hmm. The whole freaking country of Mexico is a security issue. Yeah. And so when you have your bosses um, as incom incompetent as they, as they were or are, uh, say that to you and you're ordered, uh, at that point, there was no other option but to make arrangements to then go go and travel on this road. Now, to for you to get an understanding, every time we drove on this road, it was either four or five uh, armored uh, personnel, U.S. personnel with uh, Mexican military or Mexican federal police escorting us. And there was no time to set that up. Even if I wanted to, there was no time to do an operational plan. There was no operational plan. It was just go get in your, in your suburban and go get it. And so uh, I met Agent Zapata that evening, made arrangements to take off the following morning on February 15th, and we did. Uh, and so we, we made arrangements. We drove about we left at 6.30 in the morning, made contact with uh, other agents at 11.30 in the morning on uh, kilometer marker 100 of Highway 57. We drove several hours to get there. We exchanged this equipment. And this equipment, by the way, was huge boxes that took up the entire uh, back portion of the cargo area of our armored suburban. Right. And we did the exchange. Uh, and Agent Zapata wanted to eat at uh, Subway, so we stopped at. Uh, we were gonna. We had passed Subway on the on the way there. By the way, I was very familiar with Highway 57. I've driven it many many times, and so we did. And uh, I drove back. We were, I was still driving back. We we stopped at at the Subway, had lunch, and then after lunch, I threw the keys to Agent Zapata. I said, "It's your turn to help me drive." 
and I could get on my BlackBerry uh, back then. And uh, there was a lot of work to be done. I, I was putting together uh, a uh, human trafficking conference. I was looking for a fugitive, a lot of work, as you can imagine, in Mexico. Yeah. And that was going to allow me some time as a passenger to get some of this work done. So we take off driving and uh, I, I called out my supervisor, told him our location and told him we would be in Mexico around 7 p.m. I even told Agent Zapata, don't worry, when we get into Mexico City, I'll, I'll ask you to pull over and I'll take over because traffic is horrible, horrible, as you can imagine. And rush hour in Mexico runs from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. roughly. And so here we are, and within the first maybe 20 minutes after Agent Zapata was driving, we were passed uh, at a very high rate of speed by two SUVs. Uh, the second SUV that Agent Zapata alerted to me uh, says, hey, hey, heads up, and I look up, and I see a silhouette of a long gun sticking in between the seats and occupied by several occupants. And I just said, I let them go. They were going, they were going super fast, and they were almost gone out of sight. But before you knew it, we... We drove right up on them and came up, came up right on them. They were probably at that point going 20, 25 miles an hour, which is very rare. Think of uh, right. any interstate in the U.S. to start going that slow. And they immediately positioned themselves, one in front of us, one next to us, and, and started to force us off uh, the highway into the shoulder. And I asked Daniel Zapata to try to navigate through them. And he tried, but they repositioned themselves a second time. The vehicle next to him, almost mirror to mirror, took out AK-47s and were pointing them uh, and ordering all of this in Spanish, yelling to pull over, pull over and stop. Well, eventually, in order to avoid a collision, you know, the front vehicle stops while simultaneously the vehicle next to you pushes to the right, which is called a rolling roadblock. And they successfully uh, did that and pushed us to the right shoulder of, of this interstate and uh, came to a complete stop. Eight eight cartel members. Now, we didn't know there were cartel members at that time. A lot of people ask me what they look like. Sometimes people think they're all in black or camouflage or military. No, these guys are very clean cut t-shirts, jeans. Uh, most of them are very uh, short in stature and um, and long guns. The main guy comes over to Jaime Zapata's door, the driver's side door, and actually yanked it and opened the door. Uh, you see, the Suburbans at that time, when you place them in park, it unlocked all four doors. But immediately, as soon as the the this cartel member opens the door, Jaime Zapata slams the door shut immediately, and we lock those doors. And they start yanking and yanking at the door handles, slamming on the on the windows to open, open, get out, open the windows and get out. We're both at that point, our... when, when all that started happening, how were you and him talking to each other? What was going through your mind? It, it had to have been a lot going on mentally. Is and what was what um, it, feel it, it? It was, um, it, the disbelief hadn't kicked right yet. I, I'm, I was yelling, uh, Jaime, Jaime didn't say a word, we didn't communicate to each other. Um, I was the one yelling at them in Spanish that we're U.S. diplomats, we're Americans, we're from the U.S. embassy. This is a diplomatic vehicle. Look at the diplomatic plates. Uh, you're confusing us with someone else. Whoever you think we are, we're not those people. Over and over and over with our hands completely up like this. And um, we hadn't noticed that my window had come down a couple of inches when we hit those lock buttons. We inadvertently lowered my window as well, the armored window. We didn't know. We were still concentrated on these guys, especially the guy to my left because I was a passenger. Uh, this guy kept on yelling, trying to open the door. And then out of, out of the blue, he shot a few rounds towards Jaime's door and like towards the front uh, tire area. And that's the first time that it took me kind of a few seconds to kind of, I remember saying like, did he just if and shoot at the, at right. the door? It, it, it was unreal. It was surreal. It was uh, okay. Now kind of the, the shift of the threat shifted to, uh, for, for a second there, we thought, you know, we're going to identify ourselves and they're going to let us go, which, by the way, had happened many times in Mexico with other federal agencies, DEA, FBI agents have been held at gunpoint by cartel. And when they know when they identify themselves as U.S. federal agents, they kind of, you know, step back and all right and then not go through with it. But in the middle of all that, two shooters come to my window, introduce an AK-47 and a handgun right by my head. 
And I immediately kind of try to post back and I raise the window and it caught the barrels of both guns and I see them wiggling them, wiggling them. And then without notice, they open fire into the cabin of the Suburban, striking Agent Zapata multiple times. Um, I got struck once in my chest and twice in my left leg. I, I did not know that. I did not feel that when it happened. Uh, I saw the AK-47 guy uh pull the the uh the rifle out and i somehow for some reason grabbed the uh the handgun which burned my whole index finger and thumb area and then he pulled out the gun and i just raised the window and they shot over a hundred rounds while they were shooting i tell jaime go 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 and he puts his foot on the gas i put my hand on his leg and i actually you know slammed the gear shift down to drive and we crashed the front vehicle that was blocking us to try to get back on the highway. But uh, immediately Agent Zapata became unresponsive. So the Suburban basically just rolled from the far right uh, shoulder area via the, the two lanes into the median. I tried to get the steering wheel to steer the sub Suburban back. And that's where it ended. This whole time they were shooting at it. So as you can imagine, it, um, it, it was pretty dramatic. Uh, Agent Zapata had been... Uh, injured severely. He was shot with an AK-47 round in his left leg. And I was attending to him uh, in the middle of that. I, I picked up my ne uh, Nextel radio phone, which was dead. It didn't work. There was no oh. signal. Then I went to the BlackBerry and I called the U.S. Embassy and people could listen to that online. That that call was recorded as a couple of, it's like 22 yeah. seconds long. Yeah, I've heard and it. Yeah. You've heard it. It's a distress call saying, you know, this is Victor Avila from ICE. We've been shot on the highway. It's the embassy, it's switch my office. Victor, Victor Avila from ICE! We are shot! We are shot! We are on the highway of Querétaro, Mexico. We've been shot and attacked on the highway. I am an ICE special agent. The regional, the embassy transferred the call to the regional security office uh, where my wife worked as a contractor for uh, doing background investigations. So she was literally five feet away when the receptionist started yelling out that oh an my. agent Avila was on the phone and had been shot. Oh so my. my wife goes into distress and yeah. uh, the whole time uh, while I'm attending to Jaime trying to get on the phone, I see one of the Suburbans or one of their SUVs take off. And then I see the second one take off, but then it makes a U-turn and comes back and parks right in front of the Suburban. Two of the shooters come out and they just look at me and they start firing, trying to penetrate the uh, bulletproof glass, which it bubbles. Mm -hmm. And I, re I referenced this in the movie that came out, a James Bond movie that came out a couple of years ago, the, the latest one, that there's a scene that they're shooting into the Aston Martin and the inside that whoever advised them in this movie knew exactly what happens because if you continue to shoot in the same spot in a bulletproof glass, it'll eventually will give way. And I think that's what they were trying to do. And you'll see the pictures online of the two, it looks like snow globes, where they were shooting, and uh, eventually they stopped and they got back in their SUV and took off. Man, uh, and Agent Zapata, he he uh, he did not survive. Uh, no, Agent Agent Zapata was tragically killed uh, in the line of duty. Uh, I'm here by the grace of God, being shot three times. They uh, eventually, eventually, uh, forty minutes later. Uh, help the right now. Think about that. Forty minutes. It's a long time to be sitting on that road because yeah. in Mexico you just you just don't call nine one one and help arrives. You have to call certain people because of the levels of corruption. And so I had to call certain people. I called the only person that I trusted in the Mexican federal police, and he was able to deploy trusted, if you will, federal police officers to respond. Eventually, he's the one that deployed a a helicopter from Mexico City. Now we were still almost five hours away from Mexico City, we're in the middle of nowhere. And the helicopter showed up, took Jaime and myself to the state of San Luis Potosí, which was about an eight minute flight there. And they took Jaime into one trauma room. They took me into another. Um, a few minutes later, uh, maybe half an hour or so, the doctor came in and, and told me that Agent Zapata had passed away. Uh, I remember just telling them to please treat him with dignity and respect. Yeah. And this whole time I was on the phone with the Mexican federal police partner begging him for, uh, cause I was so, so afraid at that point that they were just going to come and kill me at the hospital. Right. And, right. and uh, I begged them to please send reinforcements. Eventually they did show up. They secured the entire hospital and no one in, no one out. 
Um, and that was kind of the first time that I uh, kind of breathed a little sigh of relief because it, it, initially I refused IV. I refused any. I didn't tell them who we were. They the the hospital staff assumed that we were Mexican federal police officers, and I was okay with that because I didn't want them to tell tell them that we were Americans or who I was because the Zetas controlled the whole town of San Luis Potosí. And so, uh, as you can imagine, the the fear factor there was was over the top. I, I would imagine since that tragic day, uh, that incident, and Agent Zapata being killed, and uh, God rest his soul. Were, were the killers eventually captured? They were. So uh, it was eight of them. Um, one of them was presumed dead. Um, and so they recovered seven of them. The Mexican government and the U.S. government did an incredible job in capturing these guys really quickly within the next, the following 10 days after that, they were all captured. Oh, wow. And it's probably one of, the, one of the fastest extraditions that I have ever seen. I worked a lot of extraditions and... Uh, this was done immediately. They were sent to Washington, D.C. for prosecution purposes. And in 2017, now remember, this was 2011. Yeah. And, and in 2017, um, a lot of things happened here. Uh, five of the shooters, they were all charged with the same crime, uh, murder, attempted murder, attempted murder of an internationally protected person and weapons charges. And um, in 2017, five of them pled guilty uh, to all these charges, and they were all looking at the same. They're actually the, the federal sentencing guidelines called for death, but because of the treaty that we have with Mexico, the death penalty is removed from the table, and they're all looking at life imprisonment because the murder carried a mandatory life sentence. But even the guys that pled guilty to these charges, the, the our federal government under the Obama Biden administration. Uh, still had made a deal with them that um, they had provided significant uh, or uh, you know information to the government and they departed from that from that sentencing guideline and departed from a mandatory life sentence down to 35 years down to 12. And so these well, guys were down to 12. as a matter of fact, that guy's out already. Um, and so those uh, it's just a, a, a I don't know what word to use other than a dereliction of justice. Oh my uh, gosh. We obviously, Zapata and I did not, Zapata family and I did not agree to that. Right. This is the government that gave them this incredible deal. And let me tell you, I worked a lot of cases and as a federal agent. I had never seen the government be so uh, 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 on the side of the bad guys. And as a matter of fact, at one point in, in Washington, during a big conference meeting there, at the Department of Justice, I stood up and I told them I, I, I was being I was very angry and I told them, I'm sorry, I, I don't know where I'm at. What building and what office am I in? Because this is not the U.S. Attorney's Office. This seems to be the Federal Public Defender's Office because that's how you people are acting. Um, I used to be a federal probation officer before I was an agent, so I understood the U.S. courts. I know the federal sentencing guidelines and I know the, the, the court procedures and these people made these deal with these animals and these evildoers uh, without our consent. And so two of them that didn't say a word went to trial. We went to trial, I testified and all that, and they were found guilty and, and sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, if you go online and search it right now, you will find that press release, but you're not going to find the any information on the other five defendants that I just told you because the government didn't want to acknowledge that they give them this deal. So... Um, so then, okay, they get sentenced to life. A couple of years later in 2019, those two defendants that were sentenced to life uh, filed an appeal saying that the murder conviction should be thrown out because the murder happened outside of the United States, meaning they call it extraterritorial. Okay. And so it went to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals agreed with the defendants and dismissed the murder charge. They vacated it. They took threw it out. I was the one to uh, pass that information uh, to the Zapata family, to his parents, which can you imagine, you know, uh, now they're still in custody for the remaining charges, but no longer for the murder of Agent Zapata. And um, and so I, in 2019, I just was like, this is this is just wrong. I, I want to do something about it. So I started calling 
my senator, my congressman, and everybody that I had met on the Hill and saying, we got to change this. And with the help of the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, we did. We did. It took two years to change it. As a matter of fact, the law is right here behind me, hanging on my wall, right. which is the most ironic, ironic part of life. He can't make this up. It's signed by Biden, believe it or not. Biden and the, con the Congress passed the Jaime Zapata and Victor I with the Federal Officer and Employee Protection Act. So this won't happen again. However, it wasn't retroactive to our case. And mm -hmm. uh, just last year in 2023, we had to go back because these two defendants had to be resentenced now on the remaining charges, my okay. attempted murder and the weapons charges. Right. And so we went and testified again and begged the judge. And, and likely, luckily, he did sentence them back to life imprisonment plus 20 years. That's... uh. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad the end result there, but that like you shouldn't have had to have gone through that along with Zapata's family. That's just that's crazy. It's that's crazy. And uh, there's a lot of things that happened when I got the call that uh, Nancy Pelosi blocked the, the bill twice from hitting the floor. Eventually, they had enough bipartisan support that, uh, believe me, I went through the uh, through the, the halls of Congress. And uh, that's really how it works to pass laws and. In Washington, D.C., eventually we had enough support that even the Speaker of the House couldn't stop it. And that's why it eventually hit the floor, I think, in October of 2021. And so I get the call and they, they tell me, Victor, will you go to the signing ceremony? Because now, all of a sudden, Biden administration is going to kind of lift their neck and uh, their collar and said, you know, we're all for the police. And we signed this law, which is a bunch of bullshit. But um but I said, you know what? I respect the I respect the office of the presidency, and I will show up. You know the signing ceremony where they sit there with the table and the, oh, yeah. the desk and all the people behind it. Well, the invitation never came from the White House, and not just for me. Forget me, but they should have invited the Zapata family for crying out loud. It has our name on the bill, on the law, and none of us were invited because we 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 believe and and think differently and have a different ideology than they do. And I think that's what they, they were afraid of to to have me there. But it's a yeah. shame that one really hurt not to be there present. But eventually the law was passed. And um, and so other agents and and family members will be protected under that new law. Yeah. it, it uh, Yeah. Thank goodness it was eventually passed uh, to touch briefly on. Right after the incident or. Heck, still to this day, I, I don't know. I want to focus on you right quick before we can kind of get into the issue of we got a problem at the southern border and you and your experience, you can need, you needless say you can talk about that. Uh, did you go through any survivor's guilt or what kind of mental oh health goodness. issues afterwards from that tragic day? Thank you for asking, because I've been just in the last few years started talking about what I call the aftermath okay. and the aftermath, believe it or not, is worse than the shooting. Uh, mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, not just the physical recovery of the injuries and that I still go through injections on my back and leg to 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 see me uh, to keep me mobile. But with the injuries that you don't see, I'm talking about post-traumatic stress. I'm talking about anxiety, depression. Uh, I share the story that um, I wanted to get back to work and it took me about five and a half months to physically recover. I convinced my doctors and they put me back. And I asked to be sent to Madrid and I got sent to Madrid to the U.S. Embassy. We want to kind of get away and, and kind of go back to work. But about eight months into that assignment in Madrid, one day I didn't I didn't get up to go to work. And my wife's like, what are you doing? You're going to be late. And I said, I don't want to go to work. And I said, what do you mean? Well, I just don't feel like it. And I fell into this deep depression and the post-traumatic stress hit me then. And this is something that I've been a very healthy guy all my life. And I never, I didn't know what was happening to me. Um, I sought help. The agency didn't provide it. Uh, they were quickly to lash out, actually, the other way around. Well, something's wrong with Victor. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, there is something wrong. I got shot. And and yes, I had the survivor guilt. And yes, I had night terrors. And I had these incredible, horrific night terrors that brought back the fear of when I was flying to that hospital that I couldn't get and even step off of my bed. And I had, and I would be sweating profusely. I'm diagnosed with hyperhidrosis because of that. And, um, and so uh, one thing that I, I tell people, there's very different types of post-traumatic stress. There's 
there's a little different type. Mine was just a kind of anxiety, depressive type of uh, PTSD that, uh, I, you know, it has nothing to do with being uh, um, unsafe or guns. I, I, I could still carry my gun. And it had nothing to do with that. But the agency wanted to paint it as, well, Victor is a liability and there's something wrong with him, rather than just ask, rather than just talk to me. But they wouldn't talk to me. Right. Uh, they, they wouldn't communicate with me. I tried, believe me. And eventually we got kicked out of Spain, uh, sent back to the U.S. And they said, well, go pick a city wherever you want to live. And I started naming cities and they would shut down every city. Eventually we ended up in Denver. Um, and But I never went back to work. Uh, they, they, I was at home collecting the paycheck, but my law enforcement call sign was erased. And let me mm -hmm. tell you, that one hurt because that's your identity as a law enforcement officer, my guns were taken away, uh, my vehicle, my email, all that was erased, like I didn't exist in the agency. And it took me a while, it took me years to realize that my agency didn't want me back. And I was still kind of stubborn, like, what do you mean they don't want me back? Uh, I was a hardworking agent, I was a successful agent and criminal investigator, and I did a lot of good, but my agency didn't care. Obama, Biden, and, and the Department of Homeland Security at that point didn't care whether I had arrested a thousand people or zero. To them, it made no difference. They just didn't want me back. And it, it was a hard day when I had to realize that I wasn't ever going to be uh, an agent ever again and work there. And so I had to look for a way out. Someone suggested to get a early retirement, and I tried, and they denied that because that would have given me a little bit more money on a monthly basis. But right. I went, I went the uh, the medical route and sought a, a medical retirement. And with the help of Congress, uh, that was issued in uh, May of 2015. What what have you been doing nowadays? So right after that, I, I, I had to, uh, first of all, I started speaking out about it because they had kept me silent from speaking out. So I started speaking out publicly about it. I started doing a little bit of media. I wrote a book. It took me three years to write that book, but I wrote that book, uh, Agent Under Fire, which uh, really uh, tells you a, bit, a little bit about me, some of the cases that I worked. I'm a subject matter expert in human trafficking investigations. I wanted people to know that I wasn't just a guy that got shot and I wasn't just a guy that survived. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a brother. I'm a lot of things. Um, this just happened to do, because uh, in law enforcement world, this, this profession attaches to you very closely as an identity but yes. at, the end of, at the end of the day, it, it's not it's not supposed to be who you are. But even my family members saw me as a guy with a gun and a badge, you know, since I was 22 years old. And so that was very difficult to to go through that. So I wanted to write this book. I, I wrote in explicit form everything in my assignment in Mexico and the shooting. And at the end of the book, I, I told people about border security, my expertise. This is what I know. And I talk about the wall, asylum. As a matter of fact, if you read that book today, you think I wrote it yesterday with all the stuff that's in there. You'll get a very good briefing on border security. So I wrote the book. I started doing some speaking engagements. And um, um, and then 2021 comes around. And I head down to the border because I'm like, what the heck is going on, man? I mean, I call my contacts down there and I couldn't believe my eyes and ears. And here we are uh, under this administration with this invasion. It's out of control. So I've, I've joined organizations. Uh, I even had a run for Congress that just ended last month, actually earlier this month. I, I, I'm trying to make a difference here to be part of the solution, to yeah. bring awareness of what this, it's not just illegal immigration, but the entire border security realm. And I'm talking about national security. I'm talking about public safety and all these other countries and how they're taking advantage of the weakness of, that we we find ourselves in right now in the U.S., and I want to be able to share what I know. And I also share my story, but also share about solutions about how we can actually fix this. And so, yes, I did get politically involved. I think it's important that people get involved. People sometimes ask me, oh, I'm not political. Well, you know what? You can't avoid it. Uh, the, the grocery store is political. The, the gas station is political. The potholes in front of your house are political. Everything is political. And I think it's important as a civic duty of a, an American so at least be aware, just be aware and be a little bit. I'm not asking people to run for office and say, listen, 
be aware in your local town and 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 find out who represents you and get a little bit involved to see and be aware. Once you're aware, you'd be surprised what you will learn and how you would act accordingly after that. Yeah, very true. And uh, I am just super thrilled that you are part of an effort to bring about a solution. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Since you did bring it up, you're an expert at, at the border and border security. I know you have plenty of contacts that are still down there who you know. Please, that in my opinion, to which I don't think this is far-fetched, mainstream media is trying to hide the reality of what's going on down there. I pay attention to some outlets that actually show footage that is very disturbing to see, like recently the the Texas National Guard undercoming like uh, uh, the the people pushing through them. Uh, I see footage, not necessarily at the border, but in New York where there are schools being shut down because they have to house migrants. And then um, uh, there was a video of a guy in Boston. He couldn't get to a Parks and Rec uh, building that he normally uses. He's a taxpayer because they were housing, you know, pe yeah. people who came across to the border. All this stuff's going on. And, and, I'm just like, what, what in the world? So can you, Victor, please tell, like, give a really real perspective as to how bad it is down there. What is going on? So I'll put it to you this way. First of all, what I'm about to tell you is that it's upside down and backwards. It is, uh, it is, it's a la la land is the twilight zone. It is unrecognizable. And it's not just me that worked the border for 20 years. It's the act, active border agents telling me the same thing. No right. one has ever seen this before because they had never happened like this before. Mm -hmm. We always had illegal immigration. We always had cartels, but it was always with enforcement behind it, controlling it, fighting it, you know, uh, and keeping it under control. All that has been taken away uh, by this administration deliberately. Let's start, first of all, by taking uh, away the authority of the border agents. It's right. very de dehumanizing, demoralizing to take away the duties of a law enforcement agent, but yet still told you better do this instead or else you'll lose your job. And that and that duty is against the law and you have no choice. A lot of people say, why don't the border agents just quit or or, or, or do all this? They can't. They, they have they have paychecks, they have families to feed, they have pensions. Uh, they're afraid of retaliation of the government. We, we know that the government has retaliated on a lot of Americans for other being just for being um, God believers and, and, and maybe conservatives. And that's the only reason. So we've seen it with the Border Patrol, with a horse patrol that uh, got, you know, uh, accused of uh, whipping migrants, which wasn't true. So, Correct. so they're yeah. afraid. Yeah. So they're afraid. So having having the authority stripped away. And given the authority to the non-governmental organizations, these NGOs that you probably have heard of, they have actually been given the money and the authority to allow what is illegal. What I would arrest you for is what the NGOs are doing with permission under this administration. And that's allowing people to come literally walk up to a border agent. I just want to tell, I tell you, this is not normal. The, this administration wants to normalize this and in many ways have actually normalized it by doing it over and over where you see millions of people actually walk across the river, turn themselves into Border Patrol. They get this fake uh, vetted. They get their picture taken, their fingerprints and la la la. Here's a paper and here's some documents. And by the way, you're going to be allowed to use those documents to get on an airplane without any identification. Another thing that's upside down and backwards and you're going to make it to your final destination. Well, when that alien makes it to Minneapolis, to North Carolina and, and Denver and Houston and Kentucky, and you notice that I'm purposely not mentioning the big cities because everybody thinks New York and Chicago. I'm talking about the rest of the country, Seattle, L.A., Phoenix, everywhere around the country. They then send a message to their families, their friends, their cousins and said, I made it. What do you mean? I made it. What happened? Well, this is how I did it. Well, here comes another. Well, now we're not talking about Mexico or Central Americans anymore, even though some of those are still coming. We're talking about Chinese nationals. We're talking about Africans. We're talking about people from Bangladesh, from Syria, from Yemen, from Somalia, what we call special interest aliens coming from special interest countries. I'm talking about terrorism. We've caught over 500 under this administration that we know of. We yeah. have 2 million known gotaways. These are 2 million people that the Border Patrol saw on a camera or a sensor and did not go get them because the Biden administration will not allow them to do their job. And they just saw them. 
they counted them and they came in. Can, I, can you imagine how many unknown gotaways came in that were actually being smuggled by the cartel? By the way, the smuggling is out of, through the roof. I bet. 270 stash houses were discovered in El Paso, Texas of human beings. 270 stash houses. And what's a stash house? It's a place where you would put, uh, and I, I put it to people this way, the chair that I'm sitting on is a product, is a, is a commodity. Well, that's the way they see a human being. And they'll stack it and ship it and distribute it However they, many fit in the back of a tractor trailer into a house to get to the final destination. They don't treat them like human beings. Some of them die along the way. And so you have those that are being smuggled. Then you have the ones that are actually drowning in the river. They're being extor extorted in Mexico. They're being raped by the cartels. They're being raped by a lot of people. They're being raped by the Mexican corrupt uh, officials. They're being raped by the tribes in the in the Darien Gap by Panama, and then they they go through this treacherous journey, and then all of a sudden, boom! You have them at your grocery store, you have them at your gas station, you have them at your kid's school, you have them in your ER, you have them in your police, and your sheriff is arresting them for doing something illegal, and what does that do? It takes away the resources of us. The U.S. Yeah. American law-abiding taxpayer, because we have been put not even second, we've been put last. And so I, 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 those are the type of the movements that we see, the, the ones that turn themselves in, the ones that do not turn themselves in and get smuggled. And by my estimates, we are over 15 million people. The official number has, I think, officially about to hit 11. And I've been saying 15, that number... It's going to go up because the border agents tell me that for every one encounter that they have, there's at least one that they didn't. So imagine if we count that, you could easily double that number to 20 million easily. 20 million? <laughs> That's more than any. I mean, people don't realize that the, the majority of our towns and counties uh, along our country are small. Yeah. And so when you have 10, 15,000 people going into Lexington, Kentucky, or going into um, uh, Minneapolis and Minnesota, it's a huge impact because whether however you feel about illegal immigration, these are human beings, and human beings need to be fed. They need to be sheltered. They need they need healthcare. They need education. They need they need a job. They need a lot of things, and so they come with nothing. And the majority of them that come, a lot of them that come, especially that comes that come to Texas, are the poorest of the poor. And then you have another category of the criminal alien, the one that is being sent by Venezuela, by China, who whole in intents and purposes and agenda is to come and create havoc here and kill our Americans. And I don't need to tell you, we have thousands of those examples. I just came back. I do these uh, uh, convention. I speak at, at, at uh, uh, a lot of the police officers uh, conventions around uh, the country. And I was I always update these uh, examples of illegal aliens killing Americans. And I could actually make my whole presentation just on that alone, Jeez. because I know the Lake and Riley case, you know, was big. And, and I'm glad it brought the attention, but it wasn't surprising to me. And unfortunately, it's not new to me because we have thousands of victims in the U.S. at the hands of illegal aliens. And I say this, I say, Scott, well, we already have enough crime. We have a lot of crime. We have gangs, we have shootings, we have rape, we have violent crimes, property crimes. And now you're adding to that crimes from other people from all over the world. Well, at one point, something's got to give. And the sheriffs and the chiefs of police, they tell me, Victor, we still have the same amount of police officers. We still have, it's still, still us, same resources, same budget. And what suffers? Public safety suffers. And so all of a sudden, people are not feeling safe in their own town. All of a sudden, uh, these are stories that I mean, you can imagine the stories that I hear from ranchers in Texas, from people all over the country that, well, my daughter used to ride the bike to the bus stop. Not anymore. There's a bunch of people from I don't know where are from are standing right there. Up in Yonkers, New York, there's a big Mauritarian community of Africans up there that have been just raping 
raping. And people say, well, not all of them rape. I don't care. One rape is too many. We already right. have rapists in this country. So one more rape from a person that is here legally is unacceptable, uh, unacceptable to me. And so now we're seeing that shift of masses of people taking resources, resources, the ones that I talk about, real resources from real budgets, from our communities, because all of a sudden your little Johnny in school who's having problems with math is going to push to site because they need to make room for the non-English speaking illegal kid, uh, possibly a lot of health issues. We have we have had outbreaks in tuberculosis, measles, um, a lot of sexually transmitted diseases like syphilis and flesh eating bacteria, health problems, real problems, people with cancer, people on crutches, people. And what does that require? Health care, attention that uh, Denver last month came out and said, hey, we can't sustain it anymore. We're at one hundred and thirty million dollars in one year. But yeah. their solution is. We want the federal government to give us the money to reimburse it. Instead of saying, stop it, stop the people from coming. No, we want to help them. And so you still have a large portion of the American people saying, not really understanding what's going on and kind of supporting this because they don't understand it. And I'll be the first one to tell you, Scott, I'm a humanitarian. I'm a compassionate person. As a matter of fact, so much so that the reason I want the border secure is not only to defend Americans, but to defend the illegals themselves. Right. The ones that get raped, the ones that drown, the ones that cook in the summer in the desert in Texas because it's so hot, they would be alive today. I was at a, a, at a, um, a graveyard, a, a cemetery in Maverick County in Eagle Pass, Texas, where 72 bodies unidentified were buried with these makeshift crosses because they didn't have any more room for them. Jane Doe's, John Doe's, and Baby Doe's. They didn't know who they were. They were illegal. No one claimed them, and they had to bury them. This is death. You know what would, would happen if you secure the border? They would be alive. Right. They would. They, you would actually protect them from ever coming and putting themselves in that situation to begin with. So I, I, I don't buy this nonsense that, oh, oh you're anti-immigrant and all that. No, no, no. Listen, I, I'm very pro legal immigration. I want people to come to this to this country the right way, like my parents did. Right. I'm the product of the American dream that you're talking to here. They came, they did it the right way, but they did something special. They assimilated to the United States of America. They became Americans. They wanted to be Americans. They did. My parents became naturalized citizens many, many years ago, but they adopted our culture. And what does that mean? It means you're not a public charge to the government. Uh, it means God, it means family, it means country, it means being part of the community and part of the church. That's what my parents did and worked. And it means work ethic like you wouldn't believe. And they worked hard, hard to give myself and my sisters the dream. And, and we're lucky to have been born in this country and to be raised by, guess what? Conservative parents. Because people ask me all the time, you're Hispanic. Okay, when did you become a conservative? What do you mean when I become? That's the way I was born and raised. I don't know any way to be. I was raised in a very Catholic, uh, hardworking, community-oriented family where we gave back as little as we had. We gave back. My mom still does. My parents still live in El Paso, and she still volunteers in the church, and she's still baking the cakes for the food. And she, because that was that's what this country is about: is helping your neighbor, is helping your, your community even with the little that my parents had. And that's what's been lost because the people coming now from Venezuela, from the prisons, the El Tren de Aragua gang from China, they don't want that. They don't want to be Americans. That's why you see them flying their flag here on our soil because they don't want to assimilate. They, they do not become part of the community. They don't want to. They want to bring their country and put it here, yeah. which is I think, fundamentally changing the fabric of our country. Ah, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely concerning. I know I'm not the only one noticing it, but with your, with the contacts you have down there and the, the expertise that you do have and the experience you have, seeing a lot of military aged men, not like families, crossing the border. So what's going on with that? By the way, that's the majority. Uh, Telemundo, Univision, and all these people will show you the family units that come. And yes, we do have family units that come. Right. But the majority, I would say, over eighty percent, in some wow. cases, over ninety 
are, are single adult male military aged from Venezuela, from Asia, from Eastern Europe, from Africa. And I have the videos to show it. You could, you could see them online. I've shot them myself. I've been at the border so many times like, oh my goodness, what's going on? What are these men? Here's the thing is that if people in the U.S. think that these people are going to just come in one day, they're going to get here on a Monday, and on Tuesday, they're going to be assimilated in the community, and they're going to be fine and dandy. No, that's not help. That's not that's not the way it, it works. You've seen it with New York. They're, they're, they're spending billions with a B of dollars, and what are they getting in return? Crime. They're getting a lot of drug use, a lot of sex trafficking, prostitution. That's what they're getting. Not everybody, I know. But why do we need more of that when we already have too much of it to begin with? And so yeah. the poor migrant worker and the migrant economic illegal that we that we talk about is getting mixed in and all this. And that opportunity, by the way, there might be an opportunity for them to come the legal way. But then they get caught up because they say, why am I going to go the legal way when I could just cross the river and get accepted? So the legal system has also been pushed aside. They have prioritized illegal immigration. And here we are with a major threat, I think, of, first of all, the cartels. Let's talk about them. I mean, these guys, you got to understand, these are highly sophisticated criminal networks. These are not gangs. It upsets right. me every time. Oh, the gang, the Sinaloa gang. <laughs> no, 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 no. These people all. are uh, have thousands of uh, uh, members in the U.S. They're headquartered in Mexico, but they're here because this is where they're pushing their product. This is where the fentanyl is killing us. This is where the meth. I just got back from Iowa. Big problem with methamphetamine. Meth, a lot of people don't talk about it, but meth is probably the biggest problem in this country right now. I know fentanyl gets the attention because it's killing our Americans, and rightly so, but nobody talks about meth because meth, man, meth makes the, the meth addict commit a lot of crimes because they need to get money to get their next fix, and meth is so cheap right now that because the border is so open, that is plenty of meth, plenty of fentanyl, Plenty of heroin and cocaine, by the way. Those drugs are still coming in. Uh, and, of course, the counterfeit pills. Seven mm -hmm. out of ten counter uh, pills in the black market are counterfeit, containing fentanyl. And where are they? They're on our college campuses and universities. They're online attacking our youth. Adderall, Oxycontin, Xanax, uh, all those type of pills, uh, Percocet and such. And so over 200,000? deaths and i don't see the biden administration really doing anything about it other than now i started seeing some states i see in, in my state of texas i started seeing some some public service announcements i'm like man those are long overdue i want to see a huge um movement of uh on tiktok on instagram on snapchat where it just pops up because that's where you're going to find the kids that are using this and I want them to see that if you take one pill, you could die. And I, I want to see the commercials. I want to see it online. I want to see it on billboards. I want to see it. One way to start attacking all this is awareness, right? Yeah. But the other way is to take out the people that are bringing it in. And that is the cartels with the help of the Mexican government. Uh, I don't know if you saw the, uh, I just did a hit right now on the news about president of Mexico. He was on 60 Minutes last night oh my god I, uh this man is just uh he's he's gonna be out uh of his presidency in june of this year so mexico has presidential elections but it looks like they might just put somebody there uh to replace him with the same agenda these guys are socialist communists in mexico and right. they have done nothing scott nothing to address the organized crime that is in their country. You know what the president of Mexico said, Amel? He said that uh, they really don't produce fentanyl in Mexico. That's really the U.S. producing it. Are you kidding me? You think I'm going to accept that sitting here? What does he think we are? And this is the problem that, that I think that the United States is facing in the larger picture is that the rest of the world doesn't respect us. They right. will get away with saying stupid crap like that. And it's pardon my language, but it just upsets me that the Mexico is dictating to you, to us. You know what he wants? He demanded $20 billion. He demanded that the 
10 million or so approximately illegal uh, Mexican nationals in the U.S. be given citizenship. He demanded that the U.S. lift the, the embargo uh, of Cuba. And he demanded that the United States lift the sanctions on Venezuela. Who the F do you think you are? Mexico dictating to us, but you know why they're getting away with it? Because they can. Because the Biden administration in the United States of America right now is at a position of super weakness with Mexico, with all these other countries, and they smell blood in the water. And let me tell you, this, this administration can't leave fast enough to save this country. But this is where we're at. And I know there's a lot of people out there. I talked to a lot of them. Man, I ran for Congress and I was sitting out there with a, at the polls and people were coming up to the library and saying, hey, what's going on? Well, what's with all the signs? I said, because there's an election? It's yeah. a primary? Oh, it's an election. I had no idea. And I'm like, oh, my God. It was a dose of reality that people don't know. Well, well that's 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 my concern. Like, I worked in law enforcement for over 10 years. You worked in law enforcement a long time. You still are in touch with law enforcement officers. And we, I'm not just going to pick up and believe what the mainstream is telling me. Like, I know that there are a lot of people out there who have bad intentions and they do act upon it. And I can't stand the argument. Well, you're making a political point based on the murder of one girl, Lincoln Riley. No, not the case. There's been plenty of crimes, just like you said. And we know that because we're in law enforcement. We've seen there's ill will people out there. And, and I don't believe the phrase love wins all. There's people out there. You can show them all the love you want. They, I'm sorry. They're going to do bad things to you. And it just, it, it makes me feel very unsafe as an American to see what's going on down there at the southern border and, and just how dangerous it can be for the country looking long term. Uh, this kind of leads me to my next question. Like for, for Americans like myself and, and any other person who's just like really concerned other than voting for someone who believes in border security, like what can we do? I mean, this is just it's crazy. It's just like you said, it's it upside down and, uh... and backwards. Yeah, and I tell people uh, all the time, listen, um, If you, I know we're all busy and we have bills to pay and soccer practice and we're consumed by our, our lives. And I understand it, but I think now the times have changed so much that I think it's part of our civic duty to step back for one second and look and pay a little bit of attention so you cannot be so disconnected from the political world and Believe me, all these decisions that are being made in Washington, D.C. are impacting us. You're seeing it. They're yes. impacting us. And all of a sudden, when it hits our pocket, our, yep. our money pocket and our purses and our public safety, all of a sudden we perk up. Uh, I don't like the, the, the grocery prices. Well, I don't like the gas prices. Well, guess where that came from? It came from the, the people that you elected to get in there. Now, I know that that's, that's one of the solutions. Sure, we got to get, get people out, but that might not be the complete answer. I think we got to get involved. And I'll go back to telling you what I just said. You got to get a little bit involved. I ask people, do you know who your representative is in your local town from your street? Do you know their name? Do you know who he or she is? Do you have their phone number? Because they work for us. Mm -hmm. We, American citizens, pay their salary. And I don't care if it's a, a voluntary position. They put themselves there to serve us. So let's remind them of that. There's nothing wrong with telling them and calling them and say, I would love to have a cup of coffee with you to see what the heck you're deciding on the behalf of me and my family because of the street, because of the lighting, because of the crime, because of you pick it, whatever your issue is, drainage, whatever it is. But there you got your city council, you got your county commissioners, and of course you go up to your state reps and the federal. But I tell people it's... It, one day, how about one day you pick and say, I'm going to go to this local city council meeting, see what they say, or the county commissioner's meeting. Well, you'd be surprised, first of all, what you're going to find out. And second of all, the, the amount of power that these people have. And I'll take you back to, to COVID. And everybody blamed the president. And everybody blamed the this and then the state. You know who was making those decisions of who, where you could go in and what business you could visit or not? It was your local officials. It was your county commissioner. It was your city council saying you can go into Walmart, but you can't go to a local mom and pop store. You cannot get a haircut here. It wasn't the president saying that. It was your local people. And a lot of them did find out that, wow, these people have a lot of power. And yes, they do. So start there. Just pay a little bit of attention and start talking to your neighbors. Have a little gathering in your neighborhood. I mean, I grew up, you know, I grew up playing outside for hours and nobody knew where I was. I grew up 
uh, our neighbors. And I, I understand those are different times. And I'm not saying to force that. I'm just saying there's nothing wrong with talking to your neighbors. There's nothing wrong for them to know who you are. And, and for crying out loud, you live next to each other, that when you're gone on vacation, maybe they look out for your house so you won't get a bunch of squatters in there. Maybe, you know, simple things like that. They, 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 the best police are us, they're the yep. community, that we step up. And I, I saw somebody out strange in front of my my neighbor's house. Well, I'm going to call the police or I'm going to what? That's that's, I think, our duty because you start protecting your neighborhood. Guess what? It expands from there and expands from there. And before you know it, you have a better community. Now, you do need the help of the police. And this is where I think the elected officials are so important because I don't know if you noticed in the last several years, a lot of police chiefs, even sheriffs, have been dictated on what they can and cannot do by these elected officials. When did they go to the academy? When did they become a certified police officer or a, state or a peace officer? And all of a sudden, they're telling the mayor, the mayor is telling the chief of police, you can't arrest this person for rioting. You can't do this. Oh, but you could arrest this one because they happen to have a conservative point of view or they, they spoke their mind. That, I think, needs to change. That is the bigger thing that we need to go back to give the authority to our police and let them enforce the law. Um, and, of course, attached to that is the Department of Justice is around at the state level, the DAs. It's a big problem there, Scott, where even though the police, when they want to do it, you know this, they arrest the guy and he walks out within the same shift of the police officer. And it's not making people feel safe. Like, OK, they caught the guy. Good. What do you mean he's out? Yeah, he's out on a no bond or a, a PR bond, a personal recognizance bond. What the heck? Because he's the victim. Listen. We need to shift that narrative. And I think the speaking the truth and most, most importantly is by actually speaking up. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, I normally ask a lot of questions and, and it's, and, but I'm glad I just pretty much gave you the mic. It has been incredible to listen to you. And I appreciate <laughs> it. Cause I, I could go on and this is, uh, you can tell this is my passion. It, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm glad. And you know, not everyone who listens to this episode is going to agree with you, but, but uh, you, in my opinion, it is getting to a point where every American should be very concerned about what is happening at that Southern border, because if people just keep pouring in what, I don't think there will be a United States of America who knows what will happen, but it's just, this is very, very concerning. Yeah. I mean, well, we I'll, challenge, I'll tell you what I, I challenge those people that I don't, uh, I'm nobody agrees with everybody a hundred percent. And mm -hmm. I don't expect you to agree with their, with everything that I said, but all I ask you is to listen, because I will listen to you. I want to have the conversation with the other side. And sometimes I do get the opportunity to do that. And that's that's what we're missing in this country is coming together and have a, a meaningful discussion. Because I think when you start having those min meaningful discussions, we're not that far apart. I know we have the extremists on both sides, and I'm not yeah. really talking about them. I'm talking about the chunk of the family in the middle of the country where they have they they have the same concerns that I have. And it doesn't really party doesn't matter, affiliation, it doesn't really matter if you think about it. so I say this about about border security and national security, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Right. Where did it become that because you're a left or you're a right, it, it should be a matter of importance to all Americans. Because I'll tell you the story. I was in Washington, D.C. speaking to a group of uh, family members that have lost their loved ones to fentanyl poisoning. Um, and my bias, we're all biased. I thought this was going to be a more of a conservative movement, but they had placed themselves in front, in between the White House and the monument, kind of protesting and, and wanting the government to pay attention to them because they, everyone there had lost someone to a, to a uh, counterfeit pill, to right. fentanyl. And you know what I learned, Scott? The majority of them were Democrats. The majority of them voted for Joe Biden. And they were the ones that were most upset. And actually, I learned a lot because I'm an open guy. Even when I go to the border, I don't know everything. And I still learn, and especially now as it's shifting on a weekly basis. But that day was very humbling to me because you know what they wanted? They, were, they, they identified as Americans. They didn't identify, oh, I'm a Democrat or Republican. They identified as grieving parents, grieving siblings, that their loved one had died based on a pill that was full of poison from the cartels. That's what they, they were 
And I support that. I don't care what, what party affiliation you are. I think we're on the same team when it comes to a major part of these issues, especially human trafficking. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And I'm glad you, and I'm glad you brought that up and uh, mentioned that story for sure. Uh, Victor, to anybody who wants to follow you or get in touch with you or, or get your book, where, where do they need to go? So I, I post a lot on X on Twitter at Victor Avila TX. You could find me there. I'm on social media. I'm on uh, all of them. Uh, you'll find me at Victor Avila at, at Victor Avila TX. If you want to get a copy of my book, uh, go to agent under fire book.com. That's the name of my book, agent under fire, agent under fire book.com. And, or you could go straight to Amazon and order it there. I, I, I guarantee you that you will go through some emotions reading this book. It's very raw. It's very real. It talks about, about my family. And most importantly, it will give you a good briefing uh, about what's going on at the border right now. Absolutely. Uh, so, yes, please go there, everyone. There, I'll put in the show notes below links and all that good stuff. And then uh, last but not least, we talked about safety. You talked about your tragic incident February 15th of 2011 when during your law enforcement career. Uh, it's getting very tough for law enforcement right now from many different facets. Some lack leadership. Some are going through the, some are, are struggling with the anti-police sentiment. Some just go through a hard time in the career, but like, like you did with a traumatic incident, like there's just so much going on right now, including the added population to the United States. That was just totally unexpected. And we don't have all the resources for it. In addition to the crime that's already happening. So for any law enforcement officer out there struggling or, or needing encouragement, what do you, what do you tell them? Well, I tell them um, to use me as an example. I went through some very, very dark years, not even dark days, dark, dark years after that. And with God, with family, with help, I never fought the help. Get the help that you need, whether it's counseling or whatever, family, get it. It's okay. Um, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, as you see me here, is that there is a solution. And I'm going to tell you why there is a solution to whatever problem you're having is because you're alive. And every problem has a solution because you're alive. And um, and you, you got to stick close to church, I think. Uh, that, that was a big factor for me and my faith, um, your family. and But seek the help. And I want to tell the, the men and women of, in law, law enforcement, local first responders, is that you have a lot of people behind you. You have a lot of people that care about you. We People that you don't have no idea who they are. Me, myself, many people, we care about what you do and we respect and we support you. And it's important that you know that because you might only hear the negative part about uh, the destruction of law enforcement from wherever you're hearing it from. I want you to know that you could also hear it from positive people that respect what you do for in public service and, and, and that calling that you have and that we need you and, and hang in there and you will have a solution and you will come out on top of it. Amen. I appreciate it, Victor. Thank you so much.